Hi folks, this is Sarabjit here at VMware headquarters. As you know, the changing economic conditions and changing technology stacks are causing us to rethink what stacks we use and what business models we adhere to for our business and also how do we consume technology like as a service or on-prem capex based versus opex based in that context a few personas have a lot more visibility into the id stacks infrastructure and the related applications cios have a lot more visibility into all these stacks and some vendors from the technology side have a lot more visibility into macro level. And VMware is one of those brands. And today we are very lucky actually. We are talking to VMware's CIO. I call it CIO of CIOs. Jason, thanks for joining me today. You have been in industry for like- A while. A while. <laughs> Let's don't age ourselves. <laughs> How do you see this progression before we go there, actually, give us a brief introduction about yourself, and then we're going to get into current landscape, and then discussion will sort of move on. Okay. Well, uh, first off, Subjeet, it's uh, wonderful to be with you. So uh, yes. very happy. And here we are on this glorious day in Palo Alto, uh, sitting on our, our wonderful campus. So what a great place to have a conversation. Um, I've been with VMware uh, in another week. It will be eight years. Uh, and they have been an amazing transformational eight years. So much has happened. Uh, there have been so many opportunities and indeed, you know, so many challenges that the world and the industry has gone, gone through and is continuing to go through. Um, I've been uh, CIO at VMware for almost three years now. And uh, before that, I was responsible for uh, all of our colleague facing technology. Uh, and for those companies and people that know VMware, uh, you know, one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is not just the technology that allows us to virtualize our workloads and our applications and such, but also uh, enable workforces. So many of our uh, end user computing products as well. I think the other thing I would say as well is that um, there's been a lot of transformation in the industry and in how technology is being leveraged and applied. I think for a long time, IT was seen somewhat as a necessary evil, technology enabling the business to do what it does. Um, but I think more and more companies are realizing that technology needs to be at the heart of anything they're trying to achieve. Uh, it allows them and enables them to scale in ways they couldn't have before. It allows them to address markets that they wouldn't have been able to achieve before. Um, but I also believe it allows them to innovate their products in new and exciting ways. So uh, it's amazing to be CIO at VMware. VMware is an incredible company with uh, very smart people trying to do very smart things. Let's, let's focus on a little bit more on the infrastructure side of things. By the way, I'm ex-VMware as well, so I understand that it's very engineering focused uh, company, um, software uh, focused, top-notch engineering, everybody almost agrees with me in my sort of sphere as an analyst, as a, um, a techie, you know, a geeky person out there, right? My first interaction with VMware was in 2000, 2001, I was at Commerce One, a company called Commerce One, and our QA folks brought in this technology to do the lab settings. Like, hey, we can dismantle this lab within a few, like uh, hours versus days, and then we can start fresh. Uh, quickly, and that was the first time I got to know the, the brand name, VMware, right? We have come a long way from physical server to VMs, from VMs to containers, containers to serverless. That progression is continuing, right? So how do you, how do you see this, this progression sort of continuing in, 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 in this uh, sort of journey, if you will? Some of the enterprises are left behind, some are in their journey like ahead of others. How do you see the sort of landscape out there? Because you talk to quite a few uh, customers out there as well as taking care of the VMware internal stuff. You're right. Organizations are in different places. Uh, we see that both in terms of, you know, for-profit and not-for-profit. We see that in terms of different geographies around the world, different regions are in different places on that journey. But here's what we do know. We do know that there are 
financial pressures, whether they are driven by the macroeconomic environment or they are specific to a microeconomic condition within a particular segment, there are financial pressures. Organizations have a responsibility to be responsible with their financial spending. Um, the other thing as well is that there's more competition and more challenges, and sometimes that comes in the form of commercial challenge. You have competitors you're trying to compete with. Sometimes it comes from because there are disruptors in a market. My goodness, I think you know, it'd be hard to turn on the TV today or, or uh, not, you know, look at your phone and not see something about AI today. Every, everywhere you look is, is about AI, right? Chat GPT and such. So uh, you know, there are many, many disruptors occurring in the world. So what does all of that mean? It means that um, technologists, both in the corporations, but also product companies like VMware, need to constantly be thinking about how do we help organizations optimize their, their needs? How do we help them optimize their capability and their spend? Th th those things are real in just about every organization, right? Because organizations have constraints. So what do I think we're seeing happen? We're seeing companies on a journey towards multi-cloud. In, in a survey that we conducted, of, I think about 5,000 companies, we saw like 95, 96% of them were on this journey and recognized that multi-cloud was important. But they may be at the beginning of that journey, they may be quite mature on that scale, but they realize it's important. They realize that being able to use AWS and GCP and Azure and other tools, both internally hosted and operated as well as externally hosted and operated, is critical for scale, for resilience, reliability, availability, et cetera. I think the other thing they realize is that partnering with other companies is, is a critical part of the future. So how you scale and connect to other companies is also, is also very important. So I think those things, are, those things are definitely on my mind. So yes, the technology is interesting. Yes, we continue, continue to see this evolution. But what I think is very exciting is what that's going to allow companies to do. Yeah, I think that's a great point. The technology as an enabler, not the just technology for the sake of technology makes sense. Yes, changing economic conditions are um, putting pressure on execs to uh, make best out of, you know, the least, I will say, right? So in that context and keeping in mind, of course, cloud is there. I usually talk in these terms like there's a, economics of systems creation and economics of systems operation. It's a new sort of uh, uh, narrative I'm putting out there. On the left side, we create systems. On the left side, there are developers. On the right side, there are operators, operations, right? Developer is most expensive resource on the left side when we're developing software. On the right side, infrastructure is number one cost when you're operating systems. Let's keep the DevOps in the middle how do you see dev and ops working together and moving forward, keeping in mind the economics of systems and economics of the practitioners? I believe us leveraging our existing skills is very important. That means portability is very important. How do you see it? Wow, that's a lot to unpack. Um, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Uh, it's, it's a good question. And I think the you know, the reason why it's kind of tangled together is because there's so much happening, right? There's the, you know, a, a lot of cloud development, certainly earlier earlier to middle cloud development happened, uh, happened outside of IT and happened, uh, you know, in developer communities that were trying to do things afresh and new. Um, and eventually, uh, uh, you know, IT organizations kind of caught up with that. So, you know, and then they start thinking about, you know, governance and they start thinking about cost control and they start thinking about, you know, scalability and availability. So those things come into mix. So there's a, there's a journey that people have been on and people are on that. So we talk about the technology journey, but there is absolutely a people journey. One of the things I'm particularly mindful of is that when things happened earlier in that cloud journey, they tended to be vendor specific. So people often learned skills that were specific to AWS or GCP or Azure or, or, or another solution. Um, or people had invested much of their career in learning about virtualization and hyperscalers like VMware as an example, right? And leveraging VMware's technology and how they would operate that on-prem and such. But I think what we realize now, when we talk about multi-cloud, we're not just talking about, and, and importantly, we're not just talking about 
using multiple clouds. We're talking about harnessing the potential of designing things so that they are cloud agnostic. Because let's take it from my perspective, right? So I'm responsible for making sure as a company, when we develop solutions, we understand the cost implications of running them, we understand the operating considerations of them, and we understand what we can do with them in the future. So scalability, availability, you know, cost and potential is really important. And if we've designed something so it will only work on one cloud provider, we've actually created future risk for the company. We've created technical risk, but we've also created commercial risk, right? Now, when you think about something multi-cloud, when, when the engineers in your community and, and, um, and others think about developing something that's more, truly multi-cloud, they are de-risking the technology component and they are increasing commercial flexibility, and that's really important. The other thing they're doing, they're increasing their longevity and their flexibility in the marketplace. If the, question, if the answer to the question is, do you understand Google, AWS, you know, or Azure or something else, and the answer is yes, you are far more valuable in the marketplace because you can be adaptable. And I think that's the journey we need to take people on. And by the way, to be clear, it's the same journey I've needed to bring my team on here at VMware. VMware is not immune to this. We have these same challenges and we are on that same journey. Yeah, that's, that's great. Actually, there's a concept of a skills gravity, actually, a new term I have put out there. It's catching on gradually. Everybody talks of data gravity, right? Oh. Data gravity, data gravity, but skills have a lot of gravity as well. Yeah. People who have invested in VMware certification, AWS certification, mm -hmm. Google certification, they, they want to leverage that, right? The practitioners, right? And the companies who have invested in their people, they want to leverage that too. So I, in, in that context, I, I, I believe the, the, the skills which have longevity they they tend to give you better economics, you know. Uh, no question. I actually I'm going to uh, just switch topics just for a moment, st staying with the the the, uh, the theme, but using a different technology example. So I think an example I would give you is uh, I remember a conversation I had with uh, with a uh, with uh, an employee a number of years ago, and uh, we were talking about changing a particular telecommunications technology. The specifics aren't important in that regard. But the, the person I was talking to said, well, I guess I'll be made redundant um, because my experience is with Vendor X's product. And, uh, and I was kind of, honestly, I was shocked by, by the comment. And I, you know, I said, well, I'm confused. Why do you think that is? And I, well, because I'm a such and such engineer. Um, and I said, no, you're a telecommunications engineer who so far has had their experience and their certification in this one vendor's product. Well, I'm happy to say this person's still very happily employed by VMware <laughs> and they do amazing work and I, I, I don't know how many different certifications they have under their belt now, but here's what I also know. Because they've worked with multiple vendors, because they know how to achieve things with multiple vendors, yes, it's made them more valuable because they can say, hey, I can work with vendor X, Y, or Z. But you know what makes them even more valuable? They understand the implications and the complexities and the capabilities and possibilities across all those vendors. I would apply exactly the same story and the same journey to people who are working in a multi-cloud environment today. Understanding the differences is important. Understanding where you can extract value from cloud provider A, but not limit yourself because you have constrained yourself to cloud provider A is really, really important. And, and I know as a CIO, I am very mindful that I need to have that flexibility. I need to know multi-cloud doesn't just mean I'm working on many different clouds. It means that I have full cloud portability and mobility. How about being a CIO of a tech company, and you also talk to a lot of CIOs of other tech companies and other non-core tech companies, you know, like it can be auto industry or healthcare. Um, what are the top priorities uh, they have these days or the, what's on top of their mind, in, including yours? Um, sure. I think uh, let's start with some things that are common. Mm -hmm. Organizations are trying to do more with less. That's not a new conversation. I've heard that throughout my career. But I think what's unusual right now is they're trying to do it very, very quickly. I think one of the things that happened during the pandemic is that organizations realized they needed to adapt very quickly. 
Initially, it was getting employees to work remotely and be productive remotely. Um, but also what happened is they realized that they needed and could operate differently. We saw retailers have to adapt how they delivered their products, how they supplied their products to people. That really transformed a lot of shifting uh, or shifting in thinking. Because if you think about it, it used to be the focus was people at checkouts, right? How do we get people through the checkout as quickly as possible? How do we do this? To reduce touch, to zero touch, to direct delivery. So organize, many industries, and I used retail as an example, but many industries had to really think about what is our core business and how can we do this in a way that's safe, that's efficient, that's fast. And they were competing at the same time. So the pandemic really forced companies to reevaluate a lot of things that they'd just taken for granted for a long time. Well, what does that mean from a technologist perspective? Well, it means that the demands from the business shift, the standard let's just operate, let's just keep the ship steady and reliable and make sure all the systems are up and available and all those other things too. My goodness, we have to reinvent how we do business and we have to do it really quickly and we have to scale in ways we've never considered before happen so dramatically. Well, what we have also see that happened for the pandemic, but that momentum has continued. It hasn't slowed down, it has continued. So I think that's common across almost every factor. You know, if you think about healthcare, my goodness, healthcare was challenged in, in ways we can't even imagine, I mean, the human price that, you know, healthcare professionals, but, but also the technologists that were supporting them and enabling them in new and, uh, new and important ways. We're seeing in retail, we're seeing in technology, especially we talked about, you know, some disruptive technology. So business is moving more quickly. The, the point I'm trying to make is business moving more quickly. It's trying to scale very, very, very quickly. And I think you see that just about everywhere. Um, and you certainly see it inside of tech companies. Because if, if our customers need to move more quickly, they need us to be ahead of them, which means we need to be at least two or three steps ahead. Uh, because of you know, innovation and creativity and development times and, and all of those other things. So which brings us, I think, probably to the topic that I am most passionate about, which is while technology is exciting, and I've been, you know, I've been uh, playing with technology since I was, oh my goodness, 10, 11 years old, in one way, shape or form, the thing that I'm really passionate about is the people that make it happen. And if you want to be the best company, so technology company, if you want to create the best products, you want to create the best solutions that help people meet the challenges of the future, you have to have the best people. Sure. And here's the kicker. They don't all look the same, think the same, live within a 50 mile radius of where you have an office. Um, they have different beliefs, they have different passions. They have different family situations. So you have to also have a culture that creates the space and opportunity for those people to come together, both literally in a beautiful campus like this, and also figuratively, because if you have enabling technologies that allow people to do that. And that, for me, when companies say, what's the magic source? What's the thing, right? And sometimes people reel off a, a list of patents, and sometimes people might mention a particular leader. Uh, for me, You've got to have a culture and a set of values that really sustain an organization that people gravitate towards. Well, that's, that's so true. Actually, we're in the knowledge economy and um, companies with the best people are, are winning. We, we, we see that along. And then, of course, the culture plays a huge role. Diversity is a huge topic, I believe. Especially if you want to be a global company, you have to look global and think global as well. Right? So if you want to serve, if you want to solve the problems of the world, <laughs> you have to look like the world, right? So, yeah. May, may I add to, to what I said? So I talked about kind of creating that space for people and finding the best people. There's another piece to this as well, which is you also have to challenge those people to do amazing things. So part of that, the value and the culture, the values you have and the culture you have to have is also a place where you are challenging people to do their best work having people think and explore in new ways and raising the bar. So when we talk about you know, our cloud transformation as a company, our multi-cloud journey as a company, we're thinking about, yes, 
the infrastructures and the cloud services we use. Yes, we're absolutely thinking about cost and cost management. How do we do that in an efficient way? But we're also thinking about what are the skills that those people are going to need? How are we going to design and build applications in the future that are going to leverage those multi-cloud environments? How are we going to harness AI? How are we going to do it in a responsible and meaningful way? So there are some of the things you've got to do as well. Yeah, you've got to create a great pool of people. You've got to have a culture where they truly come and join into that conversation and you've got to set a high bar and challenge them because otherwise you just got a group of smart people. True, actually you have to make them take risks, right? Yeah. So some, sometimes more control, sometimes like you know, experimentation. So yeah, that, that's, that's what defines culture and culture is a very messy sort of uh, construct to define but it just happens, you know. Um, I, th I think it has actually, I, I do think it happens, but I do also think it has to be intentful. Yeah, I totally agree, totally agree, actually. And I think that's where the leadership and the policy and, and comes into, into play. Jason, I, um, I, I know that VMware is talking a lot about this one sort of narrative um, that IT leaders have to play in a way that they're playing both offense and defense. Shed some light on that, please. Yeah, I, th I think I've touched on it in some of the other things I've mentioned, but I think it really comes down to this. Offense, you need to be able to enable the business to achieve, um, achieve incredible goals as quickly as possible by transforming the business, by meeting that, by competing in the marketplace. So you have to be on off offense there. You have to be out there and doing it and making it happen. But recognizing that in many cases, uh, technology and technology related services have grown out of control in a lot of companies. I, I talk a lot about tech, technology debt, how it's the sandbags that weigh down an organization's balloons. Um, I, I think it's really important that companies also are on defense around spend. How are you going to manage your cloud spend? It's interesting, I think in, uh, in a survey we did, um, uh, we conducted as a company, we also found I think it was like 76% of organizations were concerned about cloud cost, um, which, which in and of itself doesn't surprise me. I, I really want to know what the other 24% are doing. Uh, <laughs> <That's something laughs> yeah, so, so is, it, is it that they figured it out or that they've got such big pockets they don't care? But, but I, I, rec I believe whether we're talking about multi-cloud and managing costs there, but just in general, technology costs, you need to make sure that you're managing your technology estate, you're managing your technical debt, because here's the deal. If you sustain legacy environments, if you continue to have to support them, energize them, secure them, have people maintain them, you aren't doing the other stuff that's moving your company forward. So I think that's really important. So offense, being out there, making it happen, leveraging technology to enhance and enable the organization that ends. Defense, protecting and securing for the organization and managing your costs efficiently so you can invest more into the future. Well, that's great. Um, another thing, actually, um, is the which a lesson I learned during dot com. Sometimes we swing the pendulum to to acute levels where it's hard to recover for some companies or some entities or an industry. Sometimes, right? Um, there's a book called Narrative Economics. Actually, it, it sheds some light on that as well. Like narratives take hold of the industry or some some companies overdo it um, any warning any um, advice to the leaders out there to to keep it real kind of stuff yeah eyes on the prize don't forget what your business or your organization is about make sure that the technology and the technology services you use are clearly and qualitatively and quantitatively supporting what the end goal of your organization is uh, you can become um, overly interested in the technology uh, and forget what your purpose is. And I think making sure an organization's uh, investments, its, uh, its people are focused on what the ultimate business objectives or organizational objectives are. That's super, super important. Yes, should you be curious around what technology should do? Should you be curious around what the potentials are and what the potential pitfalls are? Absolutely. But, but make sure your energies and your effort are really focused on where you're trying to get to. That's, I think that, that's a great note to end this discussion on. Jason, thank you for joining me. Um, to my audience, to my listeners, where they can find you easily. 
Twitter? What do you prefer the most? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the easiest place to find me. All right, great. With that, thank you very much, Jason. Thank you. It was great to have this dialogue with you at this beautiful headquarters. I will shoot some B-roll here and uh, it will refresh some memories as well. Thank you.